From the world of AV programming and control with James King, I'm Steve Greenblatt, and this is Ask the Programmer. Hey, James, how are you today? Doing good. And yourself, Steve? I'm doing well. I'm glad we're back and we're, uh, we have a uh, solo episode, if you will, this time. And you know, uh, we were talking uh, about some ideas as to what we should cover because we, we're trying to do more about asking the programmer. That's our name and uh, the intention of this. So um, I decided to ask ChatGPT uh, what are some questions for Ask the Programmer. So we're going to take a few of those and, and discuss them in this episode. So you, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. So um, there's many on, on the list when I asked ChatGPT and uh, I'll run down a few that we've already covered uh, in previous episodes. We, we've talked about um, integration and interoperability. Um, we've talked about audio programming. Uh, we, we've talked about user interface talked about control systems and automation and uh, protocols and APIs, uh, security. Uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about really is, um, is like scalability and performance uh, of programming, which kind of gets into um, how do you write your code? And um, is, is it important to write code in a certain way or is it just a matter of making the system work? Because in the end, a client is paying for a functional system. But if you think about it, and, and I learned this a long time ago, that um, the an AV system really is never truly done. And I think a lot of people will hopefully relate to that. And, and if the system is not truly done, the programming is not truly done. And one of the things that programmers get a black eye about is changes. Why does it take so much time? Why does it cost so much money? I just want to do this little thing. I just want to change out a device. You're charging me more for the change than you are for the product that I bought. So let's talk a little bit about that. How do we, how do we address some of those things? Um, and and um, so with that, to me, that kind of gets into, well, how do we write our code? Because what causes us to... Uh, take more time. And usually we're pretty good about charging for the time that we uh, are using rather than marking something up, even though it may seem that way. But if we talk about what takes a lot of time, it, it, it's not being prepared to implement a change and not being prepared to accommodate um, something new that's come in if you have to add a button and it causes you to redesign a whole page on a touch panel, that's a problem. Um, or if it, 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 you changing out a device causes you to rewrite a, a large block of code. So um, from your experience, either as a programmer or as um, somebody who is hiring a programmer, what, um, what, what are some of the thoughts that come to mind for you? Uh, that, a lot of questions there, but yeah, no, um, it's the scalability is definitely the hardest thing I would say is like to look at because is to make it scalable, you gotta be able to do a lot of functionality. So how bloated are you making your code in the beginning, just so you can make it scalable? Or are you going to streamline your code, which will make the performance nicer? But then, like you said, is, okay, I need to change out this one piece of gear is if it's so streamlined, you don't have that built in, you got to rewrite your code. Then there's that higher cost to rewrite a new code. So it's definitely um, a balancing game uh, to try to get the streamline and functionality and like i've seen this where people will write their code that dictate what's shown on the touch panel and they will have one touch panel file for all their rooms that have multiple pages on there the problem is that when you get a little hiccup in that it might throw the wrong page up and then you're totally confusing your users i don't understand the purpose of that you, you know you have one file you can push out to all your touch panels it makes it great until it's not where is if you had one file and that file 
was just for that room and say, okay, I have to reload this file onto this room. You knew exactly what you were doing and you knew how that page worked. Um, so, yeah, it's one of those things where it's you got to find that balancing act. In. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. And that makes a lot of sense, especially if, if you are trying to go back to something after you've had it uh, sit for a long time and you've, you don't really recall why you did what you did. I mean, certainly documentation comes in and, um, and, or if you have to hand off your code to somebody else, um, I can imagine the look on somebody's face if they don't understand that a, there's a lot built in to base code that you're not necessarily using. And and I've I've seen that before where we've been handed projects that we they really are kind of like a rat's nest, but I'm sure that the p person that was originally doing it had a reason to do it the way they did and had things in mind and was coming up with their own model to allow them to create code faster and be more efficient and and um, being, a, being able to maybe even reduce costs because they had base code that they worked from. Um, so I, I can I can understand that too. Um, you, you touched on you know being bloated and and I think it, as we look forward, we are controlling more devices that require a lot of uh, communication, a lot of status. Feedback is no longer an option. True feedback, we're we're always uh, including true feedback and and uh, a lot of the the new uh, network based protocols. They they require a lot more um, overhead than in the past, and especially when you're looking at a product like uh, AV over IP, where you have potentially an infinite number of endpoints. Um, that is also something to consider when writing code. To your point about being um, streamlined and optimized, you don't want to get into a situation where you're you're continuing to grow that and you end up impacting the performance of the processor. It, it, this is a kind of a new concept because it, it never was the case. Um, it was always that we had plenty of processor power to do what we needed because it wasn't that, that, that um, labor intensive, if you will, or processor intensive, but, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh... You have to be the newer technology allows our processors to be um we'll have to have more because now we're not limit our resources but again i like to try to keep myself streamlined uh as much as possible but allow for the flexibility yeah it, it's um it's just something new to consider and it, it kind of comes down to you know how you're writing you're writing your code to also know that somebody can grow with it and um and it and it is written for for changes to support modifications to support updates because the um the, the systems these days they're um they, they they don't necessarily get reprogrammed all that often if if you can help it so you know and and they're they're certainly going to be updated with new technology over time or at least um, I, I've seen the, the, um, the user preferences and the user's needs change. So it requires code to be updated and that needs to be done responsibly. Yeah, no, the users definitely do want to request a lot, but a lot of time the code, the change that they're requesting, if you formalize the code correctly, there should be easy changes. Um, because usually it's like, oh, the display broke and we place another one in. Or hey, this switcher change, and then we'll add um or we add a new functionality, but the the meat of the system is still there, it's just a different functionality. So having where you can add those easily or is what I like to try to do on uh, my code, like Almost like I kind of like we talked about standards for equipment, and I also I, my standards is the functionality of the room. It may not be the equipment. The code is supposed to work a certain way and have that be able to 
to live and breathe with how each room changes. I think that's actually a good point too, to be able to separate the functionality of the system from the 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 device control and the functionality we we typically call business logic and that's really how the room works and if you can make that almost uh, be in, independent of how the product works and and have the interface between the business logic and the product be the same i think you'll get get a lot of um a, a lot of longevity out of your code and be able to do those updates. So, um, so, so there, there's uh, th that kind of gets into the architecture that gets into thinking about writing code that that isn't just for this one off time. It it it, it it's done so that there is a future in mind. Um, one of one of the other. You know things uh, that GPT ChatGPT talked about was um, coding best practices, and you know I, I know that it you know it, it may not matter to a lot of people, but there there certainly are ways of writing code that are easier to understand, and ways of writing code that are not as easy to understand. And you know we've talked about um, source code, and that's a big thing in this industry. And if you are given source code, you have to be able to know what it is and you have to be able to use it and have and and um, be able to modify it because just because you have it, that doesn't mean that it's really that useful if you can't understand it or you're not well versed. So um, any any thoughts about you or do you, do you see a day where we're going to have more um, requirements about how programming is written and, and, you know, in a specification rather than just the, the functionality that it needs to, to provide? Well, I see that coming down in the future. I really hope so, but I don't see it happening. And the reason why I don't see it happening is right now, I don't think the higher ups, the uh, people who are making those decisions understand or understand the importance of it. Um, they just want the functionality of the room and you know get the job done, move on. And that's where you and I have kept uh, with this uh, show and so we kind of say how us programmers need to bring our voices and bring that value that we bring to these folks so they understand what we do and how we go about it and what works for us and what doesn't. But to that gets into those administration's heads. I don't think, I think it's, they're just going to blindly accept what is being told to them. Like if a company comes in and goes, all right, we, we need to write this in basic. And I go, okay. Now any, us program, anyone who knows program and it knows anything about basic, basic is dead. It's a dead language. No one writing in basic anymore. But unless you know that, you're not going to question it. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's an interesting conversation because I, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a long road until that is something that's understood because a lot of what we do, the average person, client, user, even the project manager or the, or the people involved in, in implementing the project don't understand. But I, agree with you that it's kind of our job to educate and let people know the difference between good and bad. And, and, um, well, maybe it, it is, um, comes down to us defining those best practices and making them public, doing it through some type of an organization or pointing to something that already exists. You know, something is as easy as commenting. If you don't have comments in your code, uh, it makes it, so much more difficult to manage, maintain, troubleshoot, so forth. And uh, and while comments make no difference in terms of the performance, they make all the the difference in terms of maintenance and support. So it's um, just things like that, I think, that we are dealing with that our audience 
should be relating to. And, and we're, we're hoping that what we're doing and having this podcast and having these conversations, we can bring them to light more and, and share more, even to people that are listening, that can, that can provide this to their boss, their coworker, their clients, and let them know that these are some things that, that need to be considered. Agreed. And th again, that's why we keep talking about us uh, programmers need to get that voices out there and show you the value we bring. Yeah, I th think it comes down to, to establishing that community and, and um, we're hoping little by little we, we continue to do that. I think that that's a good place for us to wrap this one up, but we'll be back to chat GPT and, and finding out um, some more questions that we should answer in the future. But again, um, those of you out there, please um, please let us know what you think and send us your questions. And we haven't mentioned many listeners on the air lately, and I know you're out there. So uh, reach out and let us know so we can be uh, giving you a shout out. Um, James, how can people get in touch with you, uh, continue the conversation and uh, know what you're up to? Well, easy. You can find me on the internet by Googling me. Uh X at AB underscore James King. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm on there as well. In Sigma Hepma, the AB and IT column that comes out monthly. Again, Google me, you'll find me. Excellent. And for me, you can reach me at Steve Greenblatt on social media, my company, Control Concepts at controlconcepts.net. And um, just find us here. Um, we are we're are on X or Twitter at AB Programmer Pod. Um, so you could follow us there episodes come out weekly, uh, Sunday mornings. So, um, check that out. You could also find us many days, uh, on Sundays on AV and AM. If you want to chat, uh, we're, we're usually there as well, but, uh, please give us a shout and let us know what you think. And, uh, we, we're, uh, looking forward to another year that we, um, can continue, continue to build this following and community and, uh, lead the charge to having a voice for programmers. And with that, this has been Ask the Programmer.